to see you all. As you see, I have up on the screen an advertisement or an advertisement, if you're that type, um, for our upcoming May 23rd to June 3rd, 2024 adventure, 12 days, 12 nights, amazing, in Sfarad, but also Al-Andalus, Spain, Iberia, all those places, which are one place at different times and under different jurisdictions, guided by me and a bunch of expert on the ground guides who are a lot of fun. Um, and uh, also uh, by Dr. Julie Harris. So uh, very, very excited uh, about that. Um, okay, uh, let me share my screen because Ari just disabled host uh, uh, screen sharing. Let's see. Um, thank you. I am now the co-host. I feel the power. Thank you, Ari. Um, right. So we have like, we have space for six or seven couples or more individuals. Um, it's uh, a great value. If you ask your friends and CSB colleagues who were there previously, they can tell you that we had a super, super terrific time. And we aim to do that again um, this coming May and uh, can I add something, Mark? June. Can so I add something to that? All right, I'm back. are you here? You are. I've hosting. watched. Okay, I've watched all that. of the th Go three ahead. programs you've done Welcome about people. Jesus so far, and I've enjoyed it so much. I decided that I just landed in Orange County. I would help facilitate the fourth and final program, given the mayhem, mayhem of people, of people unmuting doing their dishes on the last hey, program. You know, I I, uh, I figured out how to mute them. They whoever never, had the dirty dishes they will never last time. Yeah. That was uh, that was quite uh, fascinating to go along with your impressive discussion of Paul of Tarsus. So uh, I do want to say that I am pictured, I think, in some of these photos. I did enjoy very much my trip to Sfarad. And the good news is um, CSP broke the two-year drought, I guess, by bringing all the rain with us. Was, yes. when, uh, maybe it was a Hoover, one of us. Someone on the bus brought rain. It, it fell mainly on the plane, I felt. So it kind of goes along with your Chone Ma'agel and Jesus doing these miracles because CSP right. brings miracles and has incredible opportunities when, wherever we go. So we brought the rain. I don't think we're going to bring the rain in May, but um, it should be it's – a, it's a high time of the year to go from what I understand, Mark. Um, yeah, okay. everybody's high. Fantastic. Everybody's high. So that would be Berkeley, Mark. So I was oh, just up oh, there for right. Clara's right. graduation. No, they're just okay. Semites there. Sorry. Oh. Can, uh, so anyway, welcome, everybody. I will be here monitoring, making sure none of you get out of hand today in the final program. And I will see if you have lots of questions we don't get to. Maybe we'll have a follow-up. Just ask Mark anything about Jesus. Um, but for now, Mark, I'll meet myself and continue. Continue on. Okay. I mean, it could be about Jesus also, uh, but uh, we're dealing with a crowd that is probably largely lactose intolerant, if um, if my uh, sources are informing me correctly. So today we're going to summarize and conclude um, what we've been talking about. Now, <laughs> let me begin that. Uh, by telling you that when I teach a course about Jesus at Vassar, sometimes it's called this. Um, this is literally the title of the course. The registrar said it doesn't fit in the catalog. It doesn't go on the computer. I said, tough luck. I've been teaching here for 32 years. You'll have to accommodate me. So it's called something like a hundred gospels and the confused conflicting life of Jesus, uh, conflicted life of Jesus. That's not to say that for Jesus, his life was conflicted and confused. It's for the scholars and the scholarship, uh, as we've been seeing, that it's very, very, very tough to sort of tease out um, what's going on in the life of Jesus. And, um, and of course, a hundred gospels. Now, you uh, know, if you know anything about Christianity, that there are how many gospels? Well, you're all muted, so you can't tell me, but I'll tell you. Four gospels, right, in order of composition, Mark, Matthew, Luke, and John, in order of how you pray your bedside prayer, if you're um, uh, various uh, flavor of Christian, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, but Mark is the first, as we've been saying. Um, however, there were a lot of also rans. Uh, there were tons of gospels. I mean, just to give you, so here you have the four synoptic, uh, the, the three synoptic gospels, the gospel of Mar uh, Matthew, of Mark, of Luke, they can all be correlated to each other, as we've been saying. And then we have the Gospel of John, which is the outlier, which is mystical, in which Jesus spouts philosophy and mysticism. And then we have sources for the Gospels, each a Gospel in and of itself. 
We have Gnostic Gospels, Secret Gospels, as they're called, things like the Gospel of Mary, the Gospel of G Judas, right? Slightly later texts, right? Um, uh, that are, uh, that have ideas that eventually in Christianity became heretical or non-normative ideas. Um, we have reconstructions of or survivals of Gospels written for Jewish Christians, right? The Gospel of the Hebrews, the Gospel of the Nazarenes, the Ebionites, the Gospel of the Twelve. The authenticity of these is all questionable. They're all relatively uh, late, even though they pretend to be early. Then there are Gospels that fill in the babyhood of Jesus. What was Jesus doing for the 30 odd years that we don't hear about the lost years of Jesus? Was he wandering around in India? Um, or was he uh, doing other things, right? So those are the infancy gospels. Um, then there are partially preserved and fragmentary gospels, reconstructed gospels and lost gospels. Um, look at these. Have you heard of the gospel of Mer Merinthus, right? It's mentioned by a church father called Epiphanius, um, but it's probably actually the gospel of Serinthus, um, and the confusion is due to a scribal error. So is that really a gospel or not, right? It seems to refer to another gospel that you've also never heard of, that maybe one scholar in the world works on. Um, fragments of possibly unknown or lost or existing gospels, um, more of those, and uh, modern gospels, you know, <laughs> uh, books that people claim are gospels that were written in the 19th and 20th uh, century, as you see. So that's why the course is called um, sometimes uh, something like 100 Gospels and the Confused, Conflicted uh, Life of Jesus. At other times, the course is called uh, Jesus, a Radical Life, as it will be called uh, in the spring when I teach it here. And that is a problematic title uh, as well, um, because I want to talk about in this uh, session about Jesus and his supposed ra radicalism. One thing we are not discussing, and Jeff uh, brought this up last time, you know, wanted to know about the resurrection. The resurrection is such a big part of Christianity. Why is it not discussed in any of these series, right? And uh, you answered your own question, Jeff. The resurrection is a big part of Christianity. Resurrection as a general principle is a big part of Judaism. You know that until Judaism reformed itself in the 19th century, Jews were well nigh required to believe in the eventual resurrection of all the dead, but the especial resurrection of Jesus, who reigns as God, right, um, at the end of time, and how that occurred, how Jesus of Nazareth became Jesus Christ, the son of God and God, right, is a problem for Christianity that this course is not de de designed to deal with. So this course is really about the historical Jesus. And so we don't deal much with miracles. We talk about healing, right? We touched a little bit on miracles in terms of parallels with rabbinic literature, but we don't deal with the supernatural Jesus per se, or uh, the Jesus that is truest for most Christians, which is the Jesus of uh, of uh, theology, right? So, um, so there are things that we don't touch on in this class. But as I say, many, many gospels. And um, one of them, an early second century uh, gospel, the gospel that's just called M, uh, for reasons that uh, that I'll explain to you later, has a very interesting set of verses in chapter 15. It says, then on the day of the eve of the day of atonement, 300 slaughtered chickens were brought before Jesus that he might judge them as to their fitness for the feast before the day of the Jews fast, presumably Yom Kippur. And lo, he judged and each and every of the one of the fowl to have been slaughtered correctly and none did he reject. Seems maybe it could be a metaphor for spiritual selection. I don't know, but let's just take it at face value as they did, right? Said one of the 12, that is the disciples, master, Riboni probably, master. It beggars belief that of 300 chickens slaughtered in haste by slaughterers of varying skill, thou hast questioned the fitness of nary a single one. And Jesus said unto him, silence and cease to scoff. For verily I say unto you, tis of more merit before my father in heaven that the slaughterer be spared the mockery of men than that the food be perfect. 
that it is fit will be sufficient in the eyes of the Father, for he is merciful. And the twelve were amazed by his words, but the chief priests and the Pharisees, hearing what he did, did hiss at him and gnash their teeth, for he had bested them in their own context. Test. Okay, it's an interesting story. I just wanted to give it as an example of one of these outlying gospels, right? These many, many, many gospels that have texts in them that don't appear in the gospels as we know them, that is the, the four, the three synoptics and the gospel of John, but have parallels. Remember, we talked about Jesus's ritual behaviors over ritual um, uh, 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 functions so that when people are washing their hands, he's critical. He says, you worry so much about what goes into your mouth, you don't worry about what comes out of it. This is identical, really. He said, you worry so much about the kosherness, that's what he's judging, right? Of these chickens, and you don't worry about embarrassing the slaughterer or embarrassing the people who, who purchase the chickens and expect to eat them, right? So again, Jesus is moving the law, as we will see, in a humanistic direction. So to review what we have of Jesus, very important that he's a northerner. We said this in our first, give you a synopsis, this, our first class, right? And when we say he's a northerner, we're not just making a geographical distinction. We are saying that he is a healer, just like many of the rabbis who lived in the Galilee, who were renowned primarily along with their Torah study, right? As a as as healing. He was a wonder worker, and you can we 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 should probably add here um uh um uh, an expel spell oh oh oh, oh, oh sorry ah. an oh, expeller of demons by which we mean what a psychological healer, and he was a parabolic storyteller. He told stories by means of parables. You know, you'd say. I have such and such a problem, or he'd observe such and such a problem, and he'd say, well, it's like a woman who had seven children, and blah, 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 right? So there's a mashal, there is a parable, and there's a nimshal, the mahadavar dome, a comparison of the story to something else. And those were very northern characteristics in terms of um, uh, of his, his, his background. Um, oh, sorry, that was wrong. That's okay. The second thing we need to know about him is that he was a Pharisee. Right? And again, to review, in what manner was he a Pharisee? Well, he was not a temple priest. He was, <coughs> moreover, not a desert. Desert has one S in it because you don't want two. You want two desserts, but you don't want two deserts. He was not a desert hippie, right, like the Essenes. He was a teacher of Torah. He was a parabolic storyteller, as we've just said, which was also a characteristic of the Pharisees. And he was a halachist. He was interested in Jewish law in a certain way and for a certain purpose, as we will continue on to discuss below. Oh, okay. He was also, so we have, what do we have so far? We have Northerner because of these characteristics. We have Pharisee because of these characteristics, including two things that he was not. And then we have this idea of apocalyptic, apocalyptic prophet. So what do I mean by apocalyptic prophet? I wanna be clear, and I've said this several times, but it never seems to be absorbed by a lot of people, that when we say prophet, we don't mean a fortune teller. We don't mean a prognosticator. We don't mean somebody who predicts the future. Why? Because you don't need to have to magically know the future to look at the political religious scene in the year 30 of the common era in Roman occupied Eretz Israel, what they call Palestine, shake your head, look at the temple and say, not a stone of that building will be left standing. Not a stone of that building will be left standing. You don't have to be a genius. <laughs> you don't have to magically know the future. You just have to look at the scene and occupation, infighting among the Jews, 
instability in the religious class, the desire of the Romans to have a tighter handhold on the population and a tighter foothold in the area. And you know that this particular culture, as developed as it is and has been since David and Solomon's time, is not long for the century. And by the century, I mean the first century. So in what sense an apocalyptic prophet? In the sense of an ethical exhorter. When I say ethical exhorter, think of Isaiah, who you may not know, but you should. Worth reading. Think of Martin Luther King, who you do know, right? <laughs> you often quoted Isaiah, like that justice flowed down like water, which might be Amos or Hosea, not Isaiah, actually, but he quoted the prophets regularly. An apocalyptic prophet, an ethical exhorter. Why? Because according to Jesus, very soon Caesar's rule of the Jews and of the world more broadly will be replaced by basilio toteo, divine rule. Caesar's rule will be replaced by God's. So, Jesus was an apocalyptic prophet. He exhorted people to behave better because their king their ruler was going to be direct rule by God imminently, coming now, right? Not next week in theaters, coming now. And that was important, and you needed to get right with God. And getting right with God meant treating everybody fairly and everybody kindly and taking care of those that God would have you have take care of, like the poor, like the disenfranchised, right? And so he wasn't ab initio to begin with a political rebel, radical, or revolutionary. He was ab initio to begin with an apocalyptic prophet. God is coming into this world. Let's get ourselves straightened out. And as a result, a political rebel. We must change things, right? So he's often portrayed as this, you know, uh, uh, friend of the poor, political rebel, radical re revolutionary, right? <laughs> All of which he was, but he was because of a religious and theological reason, a contention within his heart, a perception of what would necessarily have to happen for Roman occupation and domination to be replaced and done away with. Now, of course, he's often portrayed as a rebel, radical, or revolutionary, which is why students take my course called Jesus, A Radical Life. But they soon find out that he doesn't start out as a rebel, radical, and revolutionary and go someplace else with it. He starts out as somebody who believes that God is going to walk into this room and sit on this throne, right, and be the head of this government in real time, in real life. And therefore, we have to start being better. We have to start doing better, right? Simply asserting that very soon Caesar's rule will be replaced by God's made him a political rebel. And in fact, that is, excuse me, the reason he was crucified, as far as we can tell. All the Gospels agree that his titulus, the sign above his head on his cross, one of the tens of thousands of crosses on which Jews were uh, judicially uh, murdered by the Romans, right? Did not say he stole apples, right? It did not say um, he mocked uh, the governor, right? It did not say he fomented um, uh, armed rebellion. Didn't even say that. It said, he said he was king of the Jews. And why did he say that? Not that he said that. He actually discouraged people from saying that, but everybody said it of him, right? So what the titulus really meant was pretended king of the Jews, right? What that means is 
very soon Caesar's rule will be replaced by God. And when God rules, God needs a viceroy on earth. And God's viceroy is the king of the Israelites, the king of the Jews. Right. And so that made him a political rebel. It was the apocalyptic, prophetic strand in him that made him a political rebel. rebel. So to review again, we have a northerner because of these reasons, a Pharisee because of these habits of thought and because of these things that he was not, right? Right? Um, and then we have an apocalyptic prophet in the sense that to say that Caesar's rule will be replaced by God makes you a political rebel and um, <laughs> goes hand in glove with your idea that the world needs to change because God is coming into it. At the same time, he was a halachist. Now, you might argue, as we saw that Paul did last time, that we really have no need for halacha if Caesar's reign will now be interrupted by the divine reign, right? Because God will then directly dictate to us what God wants. Um, we don't have to figure out God's will from the Torah. And all that will be required of us, says Paul, right, is ethical behavior, is highly moral behavior, is behavior which puts down the body in favor of the spirit, which negates somos, the body in Greek, in favor of Sarx, the spirit, right? Jesus wasn't quite there. Jesus did understand that there was a need for halakha, even in, it seems, the imminent world of divine um, hashkacha, of divine supervision. So, um, so Jesus had a particular, and I would say singular goal in his halakha. And let me, um, I think I, I would say singular. I think he had many goals, but ultimately, singular. Ultimately, he had he had a goal that was that was a particular goal, right? That everything fed into. Now, let me backtrack for a second and say the following. Um, there was a time uh, early in the academic study in the 19th century and early 20th century of uh, rabbinics, of the Talmud and Midrash, etc. There was a fashion for writing dissertations <laughs> and thus books about rabbinic figures based on a distillation of all their many sayings from the rabbinic literature. So I would write a book about Rabbi Akiva and I would distill, I would find every quote of Rabbi Akiva and I would say, oh, this seems to be the thrust of his um, personality. I would be able to describe his personality, write a biography, et cetera. Um, after a while, people stopped doing that because they realized quite rightly that the Talmud is a redacted, that is an edited document as are all the Midrashim, as are all of rabbinic literature. And what we're getting is whoever Rabbi Akiva was, you know, what can we say? We can only say this is what the editors wanted us to know about him. So people stopped writing biography because they <coughs> quite um, correctly discerned that it's very hard to distill actual history from what is a literary construct. However, now in the early 21st century, people are starting to do that again. And they're not doing it because they think they've discovered the real Rabbi Akiva, the historical Rabbi Akiva. What they're saying now is this is what the editors wanted to know. Uh, sorry, let me say it. This is what the editors wanted us to know under the category, <laughs> under the title, under the figure of Rabbi Akiva. That's their Rabbi Akiva material. And that tells us something about the editors and the editorial process. So we're back to that in a sense. And therefore, I feel that one can do that to an extent with Jesus as well. And if we distill his statements, both the ones that seem harsh to us, like no divorce under any circumstance, much harsher than the rabbis, right? Remember last time, that the, I mean, two times ago, 
there was a range in the rabbis from you could divorce your wife if she burns the soup, right? To a person who divorces his wife, the altar in the temple is weeping for them. Shouldn't be done, right? So you had that spectrum, right? And so Jesus falls on the, the right end of the spectrum, the more conservative end, no divorce. <clears throat> on the other hand, in other circumstances, he's telling us that what, the left hand of the Jewish spectrum says, Rabbi Hillel, right, um, uh, about loving your neighbor, it's not good enough. You have to love your enemies even. So all of those statements of Jesus come together to emphasize the humanism in halacha. <laughs> Jesus firmly believed that halacha needed to be moved in the direction of loving the neighbor, loving of one's um, uh, uh, fellow human. I, I mean, love of neighbor, you know, we just say fellow because even, you know, people who don't live next door to you, right? Um, now, this is interesting. It's always been interesting to me. And since I taught it you two sessions ago, I had a further thought about it. This also um, relates to or is conjunct with Jesus's apocalypticism. I, this is a thought I had. I haven't developed it. I'm exposing this for the first time to you people because I love you truly, okay? And it goes like this. If Jesus is arguing that God is going to appear God's self, right, and be in place of Caesar, the ruler of us humans, then our relationship with God will become clear. That will become clear. We won't have to guess we don't see God. Where is God? God isn't speaking to us. If God is manifest in the world, the way Caesar is manifest in the world, then we will know God. But we will still and always have a problem with knowing, perceiving, empathizing with, I should say sympathizing with, empathizing with, and loving our fellow humans. And so even in a circumstance where God's will is entirely manifest on earth in our lives, our relationship to others will still require, this is very depressing, will still require perpetual tinkering, perpetual refinement, perpetual improvement. And so this idea of moving halacha in the, the direction of love of fellow humans is also <coughs> a move in Jesus's case um, toward an idea that human relationship with God will take care of itself. And that came out of his apocalypticism. If he didn't have that apocalypticism, and by the way, Jesus does say, you know, there are, there are two great commandments, love of God and love of, uh, of uh, one's fellow. But he concentrates in his teachings on love of fellow. You see? Rabbi Akiva, Rabbi Hillel, Rabbi Shammai, right? Rabbi um, uh, Hanina Bendosa couldn't uh, so easily focus mo almost exclusively on love of fellow human because the love of God was still ambiguous. You had to figure out how you love an entity that is so abstract that sometimes seems to be very present and sometimes seems to be very distant, right? Jesus said, that's all gonna be solved. <laughs> we got a solution for that, right? God is gonna be manifest, but we still need to work on love of neighbor. Now, whose view did the humanization or using of halakha accord most with? Well, it seems to be that of Hillel, of all the rabbinic figures, right? When Hillel said, what is hateful to you, do not do to your fellow human, that's the whole Torah. The rest is elaboration. And very crucially, now go and learn it. When I was a kid, and I, I learned this in a conser conservative Jewish context, and my friends learned in reformed Jewish context, they were told, you know, what is hateful to you, do not do to your fellow human. Or even it was put as the golden rule, right? Do unto others as you would have them do unto you. And there's a difference between those two things, which we could discuss at some future time. I did have an email discussion with one of you about that. Um, but what, what we were taught was, you know, what's hateful for you, don't do to your fellow human. That's the whole Torah. The rest is commentary or elaboration. But they always left out, now go and learn it. Because Hillel's 
mandate was that you were to learn it, meaning the whole Torah, and that you were to learn it with an eye to figuring out how not mixing wool and linen, right, was a practical application that one did have to observe, but was also a metaphor for something else, or wearing fringes on one's garment, or putting the ashes of a red, fully red, um, uh, the, the, the <laughs> heifer, female cow, right? Um, uh, you know, using them to lustrate, to um, to purify uh, people who had become uh, 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 impure because of dead bodies. All of these things that seem so literal and down to earth and very unmetaphoric, you had to learn them, you had to understand them in their literal way, and then you had to try to figure out, this is the ultimate goal, how they elaborate upon or comment upon this basic, and all encompassing principle of the Torah, that what is hateful to you, you should not do to your fellow human, right? So that was Hillel. And this business of the fellow human being the whole Torah, the rest being elaboration, and the requirement to go learn it is very much Hillel. Jesus has an apocalyptic view of the same rule. That is, very soon, once again, Caesar's rule will be replaced by God's. That made him a radical, halachic humanist. Love your enemies! Since God would be manifest, one needed to do the most radical, extreme, right, outlandish manifestation of love of fellow, which was to love one's enemies in an apocalyptic context. Okay. So this, I think, is what we've learned in the class so far, right? Geography matters. Religious political affiliation matters. Stance vis-a-vis -vis the present reality and what will come of it, right? Um, is very important. And halacha, Jewish law, which Paul says is not important for Gentiles, right? But for Jesus, in Jesus's time, it was very important because it illuminated a very important principle, which is given the apocalyptic end times view of a world in which God would soon be manifest, right? It was necessary to extend the Torah in the most humanistic way possible. So why am I interested in Jesus? I'm not an apocalypticist. I don't think the world is coming to an end, nor do I see um, the rule of, uh, of nations and humans uh, being um, uh, swiftly um, obviated by uh, the manifestation of the divine. Um, I don't, um, I don't, uh, I, I don't, uh, I prefer, not, I, although I appreciate them, I prefer not to teach in parables, right? Um, if I can, if I can have something explained to me in a straightforward way, I don't, I prefer not to do the gymnastics of parables as beautiful as they, um, as they can be. Um, <coughs> Uh, I uh, I hold little, I put little uh, stock in the prophetic as predictive, as you can see. Although I do hold to the prophetic as uh, exhortative to to better behavior. But why am I interested in Jesus? Um, I'm not a Christian. I don't intend to become a Christian. Um, I, people think it's odd when I say I love Jesus. Um, uh, they, I think that probably. Some people who know me or relatives of mine might be scandalized by that, but I, I have to say that um, I find Jesus very uh, bon à penser, very good to think with <laughs> about any number of issues in religion, both in antiquity and currently. As some of you know who know me, I was very interested in a long time for uh, in a particular strand of Jewish religious life and observance, 
um, where from which I partially uh, originate, part of my family. Um, and uh, I've changed since then. I'm I'm much become much more of a Maimonidean rationalist, but I still appreciate that strand. And when I think of Jesus, I have to think about what later Jewish, historically later, Jewish role or movement to what later Jewish role or movement was Jesus's approach most similar. And, you know, Jesus, I, I, I think I've said to you once in a while that Jews are like tofu. You know what I mean by that? Jews are like tofu. It's just like when you take tofu and you put it in with chicken, it tastes like chicken. And when you put it in with beef, it tastes like beef. And when you put it in with vegetables, it tastes like vegetables. Um, wherever you put Jews, they absorb the flavors of the of the of the environment around them. So Western Jews behave like their tastes are like their music is like Western people and Jews of the East. <laughs> Um, also absorb the culture and Jews in the South and Jews in the North and Jews in America and Israel, we absorb the culture of where we are. And um, Jesus is similar, being a Jew, but Jesus is like super tofu. Jesus is like, to use another metaphor, I, I thought I said I wasn't going to use parables, but Jesus is the last. You know, the way you see Jesus really has to do with the way you see and don't see yourself. And in the early reform movement, they loved Jesus because they thought Jesus was a reform rabbi, right? Um, the, the communists loved Jesus because they thought Jesus was a communist. The socialists loved Jesus because they thought Jesus was a socialist. Um, occultists loved Jesus because they think Jesus is a ma magician, right? Um, some academics like Jesus because they think Jesus is, um, is uh, takes a critical view, uh, as sort of a uh, um, a, a, a critical um, at a distance view of, uh, of Judaism. I actually like Jesus because to me, Jesus is a Rebbe and the early Christian movement is Hasidus. You know, I, I, um, I, I once was at a wedding in London and um, it was a wedding of um, Western Sephardic people, Spanish Portuguese people. And uh, there was one uh, Chabad guy there as there always is because uh, because when there's money to be had, you know, there Chabad uh, is there, um, and uh, so there's one Chabad guy who's joy joy handing everybody, and um, he he says to me, uh, "So I, I hear you're a professor." I said, "Yeah," he said, "Yeah, I teach uh, um, medieval Christianity." He said, medieval Christianity? What other kind of Christianity is it? It's all medieval. I said, well, there's early Christianity. He said, early Christianity? What's that? I said, well, it's like Chabad. He didn't know what to say, right? Chabad with its dead Rebbe who rises from the grave and all of that can be thought of in the context of early Christianity. A lot of similarities, but I'm not even going there. I'm not even going with the resurrection thing. I'm not going there with the the Rebbe as as um, as a chelik as a how do they say it in English um, um, uh, the uh, the Rebbe as a part and uh, embodiment of God, which is all kind of crazy stuff theologically and very interesting. I'm just going with the social movement idea of charismatic Judaism. Early Christianity was a charismatic Judaism with a leader, right? With a leader who was a healer who helped people by forgiving them, who was demonstrative, who did strange actions. Remember, she's sitting around washing his hands. I can't is not wash it. They might use this to make about its relationship with God, but it's serious about its relationship with other people in a very serious way. And so it becomes radically humanistic. And in that sense, Jesus is a Rebbe, and the earliest Christians, Jesus' group, are his Hasidim. And that's what I like about Jesus. You can sort of see that seed of Hasidus in early Christianity. I'm sure if Hasidim heard this, they'd be going out of their minds for the most part. Now, I want to. I want. I have to confess something because we started with the Gospel M, 
uh, early second century. Um, it's actually not early second century. And it's only the gospel M in that it's um, my gospel because I made it up. It's entirely a fake. This story of the hundreds of slaughtered chickens is actually a story that was told of the Gaon Rebbe Shmuel Reb Zak, who was the head of the rabbinic court of Biala, a Hasidic Jew, though not a, a Hasidic Rebbe, and one of the great Torah scholars in Poland, who served in the Polish community of Biala for 42 years. And in the memoir book of Biala Podalaska, which is the, <laughs> if you know these things there, Yiddish, compendia of memories of the town from the carpenter and the shoemaker up to the Rebbe's. And this guy was not the Rebbe of the town, nor was he the rabbi of the town, but he was the head of the Bezdin. He was the head of the rabbinic court. He was the one who judged what was kosher and not kosher <laughs> and what was pure and what was impure. And this is a little portrait of him by um, uh, Shmuel Halevi uh, Rubinstein, who was the rabbi in Givatayim in the 40s. It was translated by uh, a person named Lily Reichmann um, in um, the um, member book of Biala Podlaska. And she says, I mean, he says, the rabbi, I remember that on the morning of the eve of the Day of Atonement of Yom Kippur, he would stand next to the door of his room, that is the room, the courtroom, while a long queue of women formed before him with questions about the ritual lawfulness, the kashras of the slaughtered chickens, <coughs> that the chickens that were slaughtered before Yom Kippur, right? For the, for the meal or for kaporas or for whatever reason. Each person held a chicken and showed him the fowl to be examined. And he looked at the slaughterer, nodded kosher, kosher in his particular Lithuanian pronunciation for every chicken, okay? It said that, and I heard this orally, that when asked how he permitted all the chickens, surely there was one or two in the hundreds, because you slaughtered one chicken for every member of the household, Erev Yom Kippur. Surely there were one or two in the household that were trafe. He replied, I would rather be Makil, that is lenient, on Kashrus, on the kosher laws, and Makpid, that is stringent, on Lush and Hara, that is saying bad things about the slaughterer or the women who bought the chickens and wanted to eat them and had no money to buy another chicken. I would rather be Mekil on Kashrus and Makpid on Lashen Hara, right? Tis more of merit before my father in heaven that the slaughterer be spared the mockery of men and that the food, be, uh, than that the food be perfect, right? That's the gospel I made up as if Jesus said that, right? And people were, of course, scandalized by this leniency, happening as it did on the eve of Yom Kippur. <laughs> but they respected his decisions. So there you have it, folks. This whole odyssey with Jesus, which has been a very, for me, a very interesting and moving one, and your questions have been um, particularly wonderful, um, brings us down to the idea of a charismatic healer, teacher, pusher of halakha in a humanizing direction, who, because his story was taken up by the Welt, the, right, the, the world, because of Paul, who very cleverly managed to sell this very Jewish charismatic figure to the world and to sell Judaism to the world that was looking for something new and different, but did not want to be under the thumb of a religious law that restricted people in body, what they ate, what, what they wore, or what they do and when, all opened up and made this particular charismatic leader into a universal figure who became eventually a god. If you want to hear about that, you could read Bart Ehrman's uh, wonderful book, How Jesus Became God. 
But that's what I have to say on the subject. And I want you to know that you are welcome to contact me at any time at, uh, at my work. And, um, and I really enjoy speaking to you. You're fabulous. Want to trap? Please tell us soon. This all got to get the deposits handled so we can get the best hotels because it's high season, etc. Let us know. We really, really want to be with you, and um, and it would be wonderful to know some of you live. It is seven forty-five, and I am ready to take questions in the chat. There okay. are. Well, since I'm here, I will facilitate oh. as, Hi, your chassid, Ari. as your as your nice, nice to be so. Um, first of all. We we people keep asking about Sfarad, so I'm I be I was on the phone with Yami last week. And we're just trying to get oh. the links people can register. So I will be sharing the link with anybody who wants to register, and um, that's how you'll be able to join us because you can you can't really register yet until Yami sends and Seba send me the link. So hopefully they'll send it to me in the next few days in the new year. You'll get the link. <clears throat> that was number one. Number two, just a side note that we sent um, two CSP people to. Um, Limud UK to check out what was going oh. on there. And they did a daily update. So it's pretty cool. If you go to our YouTube, you can kind of see what was happening at Limud UK. And I believe, Mark, you've been there and taught there. The third oh, is on please. January 9th, we're hosting uh, author Jonathan Eig, who wrote a new book on Martin Luther King. And it's been getting oh, cool. rave reviews. And I yeah. will be sending that to people. Um, and since you mentioned Martin You get Luther all King, the good ones, sorry. That's amazing. We get all the good ones and we get you as well. So, you know, we're lucky. Um, well, yeah. So here's some questions that I've noticed. Number one, uh, people have asked, tell us about your class on campus. You showed us the different titles. Who shows up to your class? Are they Jews? Are they non-Jews? Is it even split? Who wants to learn about Jesus at your university? Uh, first of all, I teach at a college, not a university. Um, I'll downgrade you. College. Yeah, downgrade me, please. Um, the, the fact is that everybody shows up. Too many people show up. I have a waiting list now of of about 20 people. we I like to take 18 people in a class. I think that for the prices that Vassar College students pay, they should not be taught by graduate students as I was in the Ivy Leagues. Um, and they should be taught directly by professors. And they should, um, they should also not have classes that are more than 18 or 19 students because then they can't have a voice in the class. But I do admit 30 students to this class in its, all its iterations, and there are all kinds of students. There are, uh, they range from ev evangelical Christians to, um, to, uh, to uh, Messianic Jews uh, and everything in between, uh, including some people with yeshiva backgrounds. So everybody, uh, there's a very big mix in these classes uh, because as I've said a number of times, if there's anything Jews wanna know about uh, besides America, Israel, the Holocaust, the, the most popular topic, of course, is Jesus. Yeah, and Jeff asks, is there anywhere he could, like people can participate in your classes? I assume no. no. These are like no. very small. These aren't, no. these, as you just said, I, I didn't no. know they were actually small. I thought they were like big, fantastic 200 no. person class. No, 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 no. no you can't do it. Okay. Um, and, <laughs> no, 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 no. But seriously, we do it here. That's why we do it here. So he has to matriculate as an older student at yes. your at Vassar, take your class. It's very expensive, by the way, to do that. Um. So these these uh, kids, these uh, students of yours, do they ever surprise you with their analysis? Do they come up with things that that um, like are unique, or are they just when they when you give them their essays, are they writing stuff that you really know? Students. You know what I mean? Are you are, are you learning from your yeah. students <laughs> that I, a full professor, should learn anything from my students teaching for thirty two years? That's laughable. Yes, all the time. All the time. I mean, they really, they really, they, they, they often come up with stuff that I didn't think about because, frankly, this isn't my area. You know, I do, as you know, I do Jews and visual culture. I do, you know, I, and Jews in Spain is closer to what I do than Jesus. But there's a need for it at the college, and I, I can handle the sources, and so I do it. Um, and it's always, it's fascinating to hear what students say because, you know, to have in one class kid who had a you know, a uh, conservative uh, day school background and a kid who's an evangelical, you know, they're talking to each other and nobody's trying to convince anybody about anything because we don't deal with the question of, is Jesus God? You know, that's not, that's not, if you, if you want to deal with that, then there's, there's churches, right? That teach that. 
But in my classroom, we're talking about how who this Jesus person was. And it's very interesting to see what, what they come up with. Um, terrific. I'm glad you're still at your age. You're still learning. There, um, let's talk about the Gospels, the 100 Gospels or so. This Gospel of M, did you, have you actually written a whole Gospel? Or you just have that citation that you use to um, get to the provoke, discussion going? Yes, to provoke. To provoke. No, I haven't written a whole Gospel. You're a provocateur. I am a provocateur. Um, I, I could write a whole Gospel. I, I, I probably could write a whole Gospel in lim limerick form. Um, may, Ari, maybe you want to offer that to um, to your uh, your supporters if they if they contribute ten thousand dollars or more, they get a gospel in limerick form written by me. I think they prefer one in the Chumash, but okay. for, for, yeah. my, for my donors, I would say. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Um, so there's hundred gospels. There's some questions about them. First of all, um, are any of these hundred gospels actually contemporary to the Synoptic Gospels? Or are they all later? And who like who actually studies these besides you? Do average Christians, practitioners, people who believe in Jesus, are people reading these gospels, or good is this question, kind of in, in a world of uh, good question? Good question. Eric. So um, the the three synoptic and gospels are the Gospel of John. Um, the earliest documents we have of Christian interest are the letters of Paul. Those were written before any of the Gospels were written and have no biographical information about Jesus. The Gospels begin to be written once Jesus doesn't come back. He's dead. He doesn't show up. So people begin to say, oh, my God, you know, we better write something down because we need to tell people who this Jesus was. Paul assumes you knew him, right, in some way. Uh, and so Mark is the earliest. And then you have uh, Matthew, Luke and John. And some of these other wilder things are roughly contemporary. Some of the fragments might be contemporary with post-Markian Gospels. We don't really have anything earlier than Mark. Most of them are later. And with the advent of the internet, you can find all of these things. But they used to be like weird, mysterious things that nobody could access because they existed in one manuscript, right? Now, you know, many people who are believing Christians have to grapple with the fact that, for instance, the end of the Gospel of Mark, the longer ending, which describes the resurrection, is not present in the earliest manuscripts of the earliest Gospel. Jesus just is not in the tomb. Maybe his body was stolen, right? We don't know, right? Um, and so, you know, really the ubiquity, the availability of documents and sources has grown exponentially over the past couple of decades. And so I'd say many more people are familiar with these things. Whether they study them is another question. But they're wonderful, wonderful stories. The Proto-Evangelion of James, for instance, has great stories about the infancy of Jesus. So here's one. One day, it's Shabbos, and Jesus is playing with a little Jewish boy. See, this is already, the gospel is already so late that they forgot that Jesus is Jewish, right? Uh, playing with a little Jewish boy. And the and and what he's doing is they're by a riverbank and Jesus is making little clay birds and clapping his hands and they come to life and they fly away. So the little Jewish boy is very, very concerned and says, Jesus, it's Shabbos. You can't do that. You can't make creative labor, you know, on Shabbos. You can't bring things to life on Shabbos. And Jesus says, shut up. The boy says again, you can't do that. Jesus said, I'm warning you, shut up. The boy says, no, you can't. It's against halacha. And Jesus goes, die. And the little boy dies. <laughs> and then Jesus goes home. And all of a sudden, the little boy's parents looking to Jesus' house. They say to his parents, Julius Weingart informs me her name was Miriam. Um, right? Uh they they say, they say that, uh, what happened? And, and and Joseph says, uh, Jesus, what happened? Jesus said, not telling. Jesus said, Mary says, come on, Jesus. You know, she's very compassionate. She says, why don't you say, not telling. Okay, listen, Jesus, if you don't say what happened, I killed him. <laughs> Mary is like, oh, Jesus. Oh, Jesus. Look, bring him back. She said, no, not gonna, not gonna. Right. After the third not gonna, she said, they bring the body into the house, right? And Jesus says, Okay, get up, and the kid resurrects. 
<laughs> now those are great, great stories, right? And they're in these wild gospels. You can see why they didn't make it into the real gospels, you know, so called real gospels, the gospels that were accepted as canonical by the church. These are fragments of things that people wanted to tell stories to fill in the gaps. And more and more people know them than ever did. Yes. Right. Since we have dedicated the series in honor of a professor of mine from Princeton named Elaine Pagels, can you tell yes. us a little bit about the Gnostic Gospels? Um, I That's, think Elaine Pagels could do a better job, but but there are well, we'll have there her are on Okay, there are a variety of uh, different Gospels that pur purport, uh, purport Gnosis means knowledge to give secret knowledge about the world, right? And so rather than simply telling the story, the biographical story of Jesus and adding some moralizing details. Um, they, in the style of the Gospel of John, where there's these mystical statements and philosophical statements, you know, will have Jesus saying, um, you know, uh, uh, bizarre and, um, and controversial things that have secret meanings. And these were composed for groups that um, were not content to think of Jesus simply as a, a prophet in the Jewish sense as a moral exhorter, right? Um, and uh, as a um, as a teacher, they wanted to think of him as a sort of elevated mystical figure. And they're very fascinating in and of themselves, but not my specialty. Okay. Uh, question about celibacy, Christianity, and Jesus. Is there a connection? No. <laughs> uh, and if not, where did the celibacy come from? Um, you know, there were Jewish monastics in the, the hippies living by the Dead Sea and other play, uh, other desert uh, celibate Jewish groups. And there just was it, it, in the apocalyptic universe of the um, of the first century, there was a, a double edged idea. One part of the idea was that God was coming into the world so we wouldn't need another generation. And the other, uh, which Paul really picks up on, is that sex <laughs> leads to impurity and leads to moral evil, and we should purge our lives of it. And so there were Jews who were doing this, and um, some of the earliest Christians uh, imitated them. And because the Gospels say very little about Jesus's uh, sexuality, he doesn't marry, um, you know, uh, there's, there's, uh, th there's this impulse to turn him into a celibate but that really comes uh from nowhere there's a question from jeff asking if you would consider putting together a book encompassing your teachings on jesus no no uh, it's not your thing you do art. you have to finish your art I, I, book. I think i think you know I, I do actually but you know something that that this is just an avocation it's like jeff you know jeff i know you you you're you're really into um um <clears throat> model railroads you know i, I think I it's a different jeff that, but go ahead uh yeah no it is that jeff uh, oh, but okay. I, I don't know, I'm just making it up. Um, but, you know, you're not going to write a book about mono railroads, even though you're you're into it. I mean, we have this idea now that everybody everybody should write a book about what they're interested in. And I'm just interested in it. So I'd rather talk about it than write about it. Question. If Jesus was such a. Uh, well, it's kind of like in hindsight, Jesus was this important teacher, because now we see what happened with Jesus and Christianity. Why is he not mentioned in the Jewish text? Why is he not included in the discussion of the rabbis? Is that something because at that he was at a certain point in history where he was too late to be included in the discussions? Was he erased from the discussions? Or was he really not, what, what he had to say, was it not important enough to be included with the other rabbis of the Pharisaic tradition that you, you shared with us? So, okay, so the rabbis of the Pharisaic tradition are later than Jesus, first of all. So a lot of contemporaries of Jesus who are not also not mentioned or mentioned very, uh, very minimally. Uh, that's one thing. Um, the second thing is that um, what Jesus taught and preached was from a Jewish perspective could be effective in an apocalyptic context, but not in a context where olam noheg kibin hago, that is the world continues in its normal way. And once it was evident that the world was continuing in its normal way, you know, Jesus's radical teachings were problematic. So that, for instance, you know, um, if if Rabbi Hillel says, "What's hateful to you, don't do unto your fellow," and you say, "Hey, I want to, but I want to love my enemy," he would say, "Remember, bis sugar, you're crazy, but go and do it. It's fine." But Jesus says everybody has to love their enemy. So in a context where God isn't going to come into the world and clarify the whole situation, it leaves most people unable to do the thing to observe the commandment. 
right? So Jesus' teachings were impractical in a non-apocalyptic situation. And what Christianity did was moralized all the teachings. They say it's about morality, but in Jesus' lifetime and in his context, they were about doing God's commandments. But we can't do God's commandments Jesus' way because the circumstances are not what Jesus said the circumstances or believed the circumstances would be. So that's another reason he's out. The another reason he's out is that he well that's I mean he's sort of like on the periphery so he doesn't he's not in the main discussion, and then once Jesus of course got to be the Jesus that we know via Christianity, then it, even if there had been statements of Jesus uh, or about Jesus in the Talmud, and some people think that certain figures refer to Jesus and other people say they don't, but let's say there had been, they might very well have been repressed as well. Right. Last question. We have many questions and you had proposed having an open session on Jesus, which is, I know you didn't focus on the miracles, but you, you did compare, you put Jesus into, and over this series, you put Jesus into context. Where did Jesus live in the North? What does that mean? Um, who was Jesus closest to in, in the Pharisaic tradition and so on? Uh, you talked about Jesus using uh, parables, um, but you did kind of, you mentioned it, and you talk about Jesus as a healer again, fitting into it, but Jesus as a miracle person. So Jesus does certain miracles in the gospels, including, for example, turning the, the water into wine. Are those, can you find those miracles in other Jewish traditions or other parts of that time so that we can see how that fits in, how those stories of Jesus fit in to when he lived or when people wrote the stories? Um, are they unique stories or are they just like you showed the other stories were not necessarily unique. They fit into the time and the people that lived at that time. Some of them come from Hellenistic um, uh, stories of demigods, water into wine kind of stories um, and, and multiplication of food. It's not something that comes uh, as much from a Jewish context, although you can find certain you know uh, echoes of that. And, and um, the, the bottom line is this, Ari, and I think everybody needs to know this. Uh, anybody who says that something is not present in a given religious tradition is usually wrong. That is, if you say, well, the resurrection of the dead is not found in blah, blah, blah. It's not true. Most religions have a wide spectrum in which you can find just about everything that's found in just about other, every other religion. And it's certainly true of miracles and miracle workers. There are whole studies of miracles and miracle workers in the Talmud. The specific kinds of miracles sometimes uh, come from the Hellenistic world and sometimes um, come from uh, the, uh, the the Jewish world. All right. We are now out of time. Oh. So therefore, um, we must yeah. end this series. We have, we've done oh. eight classes on Jesus. They've been very oh, successful, Jesus. by the way, Mark. A lot Jesus. of people have showed up to your avocation class. Oh, wow. That's avocation cool. series, right? Yeah. So I wanted, to, I wanted to thank you for, uh, particularly this time of year, you know, it's nice yeah. that we did it. This, I think it is too. And Ari, the birthday people, celebrations if, if, two days ago. If you people are interested in a question and answer, a free form question and answer series, I'd be happy to do it. It's just that Ari has a very, very tight schedule and he'd have to find a time, but you can hound him. And I'd be glad to, because I love to answer the question. I mean, there's questions here, right? How could there be, have been Jewish Christians, right? How could there have been? Well, you know, um, Bonnie, there were only Jewish Christians at a certain <laughs> point, right? So these are great questions um, and, and they deserve to be answered. So if you want me to do it, I'll do it another time. But I love okay. you all and, um, and you are great. And I hope to see you in other um, contexts soon. And um, thank Shana you. Tova. And Shana Tova. Hi, Shana Tova part two. Um, and, uh, and everyone, and, please wave uh, for Mark's mom. Uh, He's there somewhere. I can't, Mark, I, turn off the share for a second. People can see like who's in the room, and then we can. Oh, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I, I didn't realize I had it on. Hold on. Hold on. Pause share. Or, uh, Just unshare. Turn. Oh, there you go. Oh, there we are. Ah! Oh, no. Hi, everybody. There it's, you go. Just, yeah, I hope you have a wonderful new year, Ari, and all, all good things. Okay. Take care. All good things to you. Thank you for teaching us. And um, thank you, everybody, for supporting CSP. Yes. The and best, making the these best. programs happen. Yep. Yep. Absolutely. Okay. You, if you want more programs with Mark on Jesus, you have to email me. And if we get like uh, critical mass, then we'll, like Jesus, we'll bring Mark back. Only, only Mark will come back <laughs> sooner, at least. <laughs> all right. Love you all. Take care. Bye-bye.
Keep safe, everybody.